and welcome to Crossroads Church. It's so great to be with you today. We are celebrating mothers. We're celebrating Mother's Day. And if you are with us today or you're joining us online, boy, do I have a surprise for you. Mr. Sticky Sticky Buns are back. I have one right here. I just happened to dig all through them and got the one with the most brown sugar. So sorry if you're looking for one with the most brown sugar. I have it. Well, sticky buns can also be called cinnamon buns. They can be called caramel buns. And if you're familiar with Pennsylvania Dutch, I learned something this week. The sticky bun can also be called schnecken. That's the Pennsylvania Dutch word for sticky bun. And it came from Germany with our Pennsylvania Dutch settlers. I just had to do a little bit of trivia just to throw that out there to you. They can be eaten for breakfast because they're sweet. They can be eaten with dinner as a dessert. Well, that had me at hello because I can have one for breakfast and one for dinner, right? So can you. So if you are a woman with us today and you're over 18, we have a beautiful table out there of sticky bunge schnecken, and you can grab one before you go. If you're joining us online, you just need to click on the connection card and you'll see some prompts where we will send you a Dunkin' Donuts gift card. So look forward to that too as our way of saying Happy Mother's Day to you. Your connection card is on the bottom of your bulletin. Take time to fill that out today and put it in the collection box as you leave. We'd love to know that you are here and how we can be praying for you. So let's join together and open our time with prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray for the women among us this morning as we honor and celebrate Mother's Day. For the women who are mothers or who are longing to be a mother. For women who have lost a child. For women who have lost their mother. For all stepmothers and foster mothers and mothers through adoption, and for every woman who is a motherly presence in the life of a child, their own or someone else's, I thank you for their tirelessness, their perseverance, for their devotion and their strength. Lord, we honor the hands of each mom we know, hands that are calloused from washing and wiping scrubbing and hugging, holding and patting, and hands that are beautifully folded in prayer. Bless the women and mothers that are here today, that are online, the mothers that are in our lives, the women that are in our lives. May each woman rest in your sweet promises that you love them, that you carry them, and that you hear their prayers. Bless moms today. Be their joy and passion, I pray. And thank you, God, that we can love the children in our lives because we serve a loving God. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Don. Let's worship, church. Let's stand together. This is a song of invitation. All who are thirsty, all who are searching, Jesus is waiting with arms wide open. Let's sing together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never
enjoy singing some of these older lyrics. Um, how often do you say the phrase, hither by thy help I'm come? Um, not recently for me have I just said, and that's just a simple way of saying, because of your help, God, I made it through. Hither by thy help I'm come. Um, we're going to learn a new song this morning, and it takes some lyrics from an older song as well, a really well-known and loved hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You're going to see a few lines pop up from that great hymn in this new song called Morning by Morning. This is just a simple song about trust, that we would trust that God's mercies are new every morning. We can trust in that, and so we worship him because of that. Let's learn our new song this morning.
This past Monday, I was hanging out with about uh, 83rd to 5th graders, and I said, hey, I, I need your help. I'm preaching on Sunday morning uh, about rules, and if you could just all help me out a little bit. One of the first questions I asked is, I'm like, how many of you just like really like rules? You know, you're a rule follower. That's just who you are. And surprisingly, a handful, uh, less than 10, but a handful of kids raised their hand. And then it's like, well, how many of you don't really love rules and have to follow rules? And then like the room just went wild. Uh, and so like I said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I, I gave them all a bunch of post-it notes. I'm like, I just want you to brainstorm down rules that happen at home or rules that happen here at school that you just don't like. And here are just a few of their things. Clean your room, uh, turn the volume down, bunnies are not allowed in the house, uh, having to be nice to boys is really hard, followed by three explanation points. Uh, no making messes, and a little bit redundant, but no slime in the house. But the top two rules that uh, these third to fifth graders just so dislike, uh, coming in at number two was simply no running. Uh, it didn't matter where at, just no running. They are designed to run. Why can't we run? No running. Uh, but number one, and I don't think this would be probably a surprise to many of you, number one rule that kids do not like is limited screen time, right? Uh, and that means that a lot of parents are parenting if the kids are complaining about limited screen time. Uh, next question I asked, I'm like, can you just give me some ideas, some God rules? What are some rules that God has? Uh, and just had them brainstorm them out. And lots of great things they listed off. Be generous. Uh, don't worry about yourself. Uh, be kind to all people. Show mercy. Uh, if someone hits you, let them hit the other side. Uh, but the top two rules and all the things they listed out, uh, coming in at number two, was all about love. Uh, love your neighbor, uh, love your enemy, loving God. But the number one rule that they listed over and over again was no stealing, no stealing. And, and then specifically, a couple of them mentioned no stealing candy. So there must have been some candy incident recently that I wasn't aware of that caused all these problems that it was the top of their mind. But here's the thing about rules, you know, uh, they exist. And some of you, uh, some of us, you know, you just love to follow rules. It's just sort of your nature. And then others of you, you're always looking for opportunities to break the rules. You're just a rule breaker. You think that they're just maybe suggestions more to you. But however you feel about rules, we have to understand that the rules were often designed for our benefit. And come on, moms and dads, you get that, right? Oh, uh, whenever you tell your kids something they have to do or that they can't do, and they're asking why, uh, the temptation and the craziness, the overwhelmingness of life is simply to just say, because I said so, uh, that doesn't go anywhere good. You need to slow down on those curves. And you needed to say, hey, this is because I love you and want what is best for you. And isn't that the way with rules in our life, especially God rules? Uh, we don't always understand them. We might not always like them. But we understand it's because our Heavenly Father loves us and wants what is best for us. And another thing about rules is, is they change, right? They can change from one place to another, from one time period to another. If I get out here on 283 and I'm doing triple digits, uh, there are some legal consequences if I get caught. If I'm in Germany, on the Autobahn, doing triple digits, there are no legal consequences. It is perfectly acceptable. And what about rules from God? I mean, there are things from the old covenant that don't apply anymore, that we don't follow anymore. In Leviticus 20, uh, it reads, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, even the wife of his neighbor, uh, both the adulterer and adulteress must be put to death. And we're glad we don't follow that anymore. We don't want to be the ones doing the stoning, and we don't want to be stoned. We're glad that there are things that have changed. And a problem that we often face with rules, a problem that we always bump up with rules, is when we try to take and expand on God's given rules. Or we pick and choose what rules from the 
old covenant that we're going to bring into the new covenant, what rules from culture we're going to bring in to following Jesus. Because they're always changing some of the rules. Leviticus 19 reads like this, you shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. I was at Crowder's concert last night. I'm pretty sure some of those guys on stage, they're trying to keep Leviticus 19. But most of us, you know, we trim our beards. We get a haircut. And the early church has always struggled. Acts through all the letters. There's this constant struggle with rules. And it always comes down to these two areas. What are the old covenant? What are the Jewish rules that we're going to bring along and force this new group of Jesus followers to adhere to? Or what are the cultural rules that we're going to say have to be part of following Jesus? And both situations always result in this basic formula of Jesus plus. Whenever we're taking man-made rules or we're taking old covenant rules and we're trying to force them on Jesus followers, it's always Jesus plus. You have to do this as you follow Jesus. You can't do this as you follow Jesus. And then Jesus plus always comes out to Jesus is not enough. Jesus' death and resurrection is not enough. Jesus' grace is not enough. Simply put, Jesus is not enough. And that trap of Jesus plus, the pain and the problem of adding man-made rules onto following Jesus. It sidelines the work of Jesus. And it pushes people further and further away from Jesus and their Heavenly Father instead of drawing them in. And the church in Colossae was so struggling with this. It was a very critical problem. It was pushing brother and sister in Christ against one another. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he addresses it head on. And he says, you know what, this has to come to a stop. And he's urging the followers of Jesus and Colossae to not be swayed by this high-sounding nonsense or these empty philosophies, but instead let their roots grow down deep in Jesus as they continue to follow him. And let's join in the conversation in verse 13. Apostle Paul says this. This is how he's just going after this whole Jesus plus idea. He says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God, then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he dismissed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Paul addresses the problem by pointing it all back to God, all back to Jesus. It's all because of what he has done, nothing that you could ever do or that I could ever do. And the church in Colossae, they needed the reminder because they were following, following into the trap of Jesus plus the stuff that they had to do to be made right with God, the things that they could or could not eat, the things that they could or could not drink, specific holy days that they had to follow in some very specific ways. And Paul points them back to the formula of Jesus and Jesus only. It's all because of what he has done. Our faith, our security, our confidence is all because of who Jesus is and all that he has done. Our choice, your choice, my choice, is to accept the gift of forgiveness that Jesus offers to us, to choose to follow Jesus, to recognize that we don't have to add to the work of Jesus, that all that Jesus did is enough. And Paul wants the church in Colossae, he wants them to embrace the freedom that they have in Christ, to not fall into that trap of Jesus plus. He says, put it to a stop. Don't let those people who are trying to put more and more on you, all those must, ought, need, should, all those people trying to put all that onto you. Don't fall into that trap. Don't let any of those people condemn you with their man-made rules. And in 
verse 16, he says it like this. So don't, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come and Christ himself is that reality. The rules of the culture around them were being forced on them. That was pushing people away from Jesus instead of drawing people to Jesus. It was hindering their spiritual life and growth. It was hindering their every, it was harming their everyday life. We're wrapping up this series on Get Back. And we're all excited to get back to normal or whatever the new normal is. But we're saying, hey, for just these four weeks, for four weeks, can we just slow down? Before we just get back to normal, can we say, is there something that God is calling us to get back to better? Is God calling us to really live in a life that is healthier for what he designed us to do, who he designed us to be? And the question I want you to wrestle with this week, are, are there some rules that are pressuring you? Are there some rules that are being pushed hard on you and they don't represent the voice of your heavenly father? They're harming your life. They're adding stress. You're feeling overwhelmed like you can never measure up. They're not in line with New Testament theology. They don't line up with where we started this series at, where Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light are there some rules that you've just walked into man and they're hindering or they're harming your spiritual life and your growth they're stealing the joy of your salvation maybe they're making you question your faith and confidence in jesus your spiritual life is starting to feel more like a heavy burden something that you must do as opposed to something that you want to do there's some everyday rules that are just really taking you in a direction that your Heavenly Father would never want you to go. Uh, let me give you a, just an example from your everyday life. Many of you are at a stage or you've been there, it's coming up, where you're at that chauffeur stage of parenting. Uh, Denise and I are like 10 years past that, but you know like where you're like driving your kids all the different places, all the different times. Uh, I wanted to find some stats. Back in 1975, uh, we spent on an average week about an hour and 45 minutes driving our kids places. Now, a more current stat, more than doubled. Uh, five hours. On average, just driving. This isn't because of just like an increase in traffic, right? Uh, this is because we think we need to drive our kids to every single opportunity. We, we fall into the trap of what culture says. Culture says, like, your kids, man, they have to participate in every opportunity that is out there. And you find a lot of parents that are just running to the point of exhaustion. You don't feel like you even have time to just be with your kids anymore. Time around the dinner table feels a whole lot more like a rarity instead of the normal every day. And you're feeling worn out. And we never even stop or pause or slow down to question the rules in our life, the rules of culture that we're allowing to creep in that sometimes harm us. And we're pressured into living by the world's rules, even if they are not what is best for you or what is best for your family. Barna this uh, past week released some different stats. So for Mother's Day, I thought I'd tell you where some mums are at right now. This is in the, just the recent weeks. And they asked the question, you know, where, where we're at right now is a lot of people are trying to just like get back to normal. How are you feeling at, at this phase of the pandemic? And we have 36% of working moms feeling overwhelmed. You're almost at the point where you get 10 moms in a room, four of them are just feeling overwhelmed. Following all the cultural rules. It says you can do it all, right? You can work full time, you can raise kids, you can have an active social life, you can be active in your church, you can keep your house immaculate, 
You can have this incredible marriage, go on these great vacations, have these really interesting hobbies, attend the greatest concerts or sporting events, and you can work out five days a week. You can prepare gourmet meals. Isn't that the way that culture or social media often makes you want to feel like you can do it all? You can have perfect kids. Man, they have their entire life planned out by third grade. You meet a parent, and they're, you say, well, how's Johnny doing? And like, well, Johnny is working his plan to be a lawyer, and you're thinking, Johnny's too. He can't have that kind of a plan yet. Sample that my wife, Denise, always would use. Back when we didn't have cell phones, I'd, I'd check in before I'd leave the office at church and just say, how are you doing? Do you need me to pick something up on the way home? And often, a, a good phrase that she would tell me, she'd say, Doug, you can have a clean house or you can have dinner. You can't have both, <laughs> right? Because you just can't do it all. Don't let anyone pressure you or condemn you or judge you with their man-made rules. That's exhausting. That's overwhelming. That doesn't reflect the heart of your heavenly Father. Learned early in ministry, you can be pastoring a church of 20 people. 20 good people all have their own set of reasonable expectations for their pastor. And 20 sets of reasonable expectations are unreasonable, right? You can't be everything to everyone. And for all the relationships that are in your life, your friends, your peers, your coworkers, your teachers, your boss, your kids, your parents, your siblings, they all have expectations for you. But you can't be everything to everyone. It just leads to burnout and exhaustion. It'll wear you down. And what's the key to all of that? You need to live for an audience of one. Live for an audience of one. Live for your heavenly Father. That's who you live to please. That's whose image you are being created into. That's whose heart and character is being transformed by the Holy Spirit into your life. And the church in Colossae, man, they were all caught up in the cultural rules of their day. And man, that Jesus plus, they were falling to that trap again and again. And it was being forced on them. The Greek culture that they were in, it was a highly experiential culture. A lot like our culture is a highly experiential culture. And it was bleeding into the church. And Paul starts out again with those exact same words. He says, don't let anyone condemn you. Condemn you. In the next verse, verse 18, don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. All these rules, all this Jesus plus highly experiential, have visions, these acts of self-denial. You need to see angels. And if you weren't doing these things, then you weren't really a, a Jesus follower. You weren't at the same level as the other people who were experiencing these things. Think back for a little bit about your family of origin. Any rules in your family of origin, maybe spoken, maybe unspoken. Uh, for me, when I think back, you know, uh, very clearly, unspoken rule. Growing up in a family business, you always worked. It was normal that my school bus stopped at the family garage, not at the house. That is where I got off and went right to work. If you asked Denise about any unspoken family rules in her house, it, it would simply be this. If the church doors are open, we are there, right? 
just sort of an unspoken rule. If the church doors are open, we are there. And that not bad rules, neither of us like look back uh, and have anything bad to say about our childhoods. But you can take these things and you just twist things that can be good just a little bit. And it sort of becomes this whole Jesus plus. And so the whole idea of, you know, like a really high and healthy value of work in my family culture. Twist that just a little bit and it becomes all about workaholism. You look down on those who work less or who had less responsibility or maybe even earned less. Whole thing about working all the time, work becomes priority number one. The rest of life gets sidelined. Work can even become an idol. It can become the number one thing in your life. You can even start to think, well, I'm better than you because I work more than you. Take something good, just twist it a little bit become something bad. But about Denise's house rules, church attendance, the doors are open. You were there. Get those, there used to be those like Sunday school pins for perfect attendance. And came to an idea that, you know, you just twist a little bit something so incredibly good like going to church. Oh, you only go to church on Sunday mornings. I go to church also on Sunday nights. Oh, you only go to church on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. I'm also there on Wednesday evenings. I'm more spiritual than you, or I'm better than you. And those kind of Jesus plus things are often easier to see in the rear view mirror than they are in our present, in our past, in our denomination, even in our church's past. Come on, if you're a Jesus follower, you certainly don't play cards you don't listen to secular music. You don't go to movies. You don't drink alcohol. There was a time where you don't wear makeup or you don't wear jewelry. <laughs> Padded pews? You guys even Christians? I mean, come on! Hard to see the kind of rules that creep in into our present day. Oh, you don't go on a spiritual retreat like I do. You don't have a prayer closet? You don't wake up 30 minutes earlier just to have that quiet time with God. You don't, and you just fill in that blank. And it all becomes about Jesus plus. I'm better than you. I'm a real Christian. Happens any time we take something that might be really good, but it doesn't line up with New Testament theology, and we try to force it on other people. Here's the thing about Jesus Plus. If you give it enough time, anything, no matter how good, Jesus Plus, it always leads. It always leads to legalism. It always leads to judgmentalism. That's where Jesus Plus always goes. We take something good from our culture. We take something good even from an old covenant, twist it just a little bit, and it can become so harmful for someone who is following Jesus. Jesus. If you're doing the whole plus thing, then you're really lining up with Jesus. And if you're not, we put this on people, and if you're not doing all this plus, then I'm not really sure where you're at as a Jesus follower. If I would impose my spiritual disciplines that aren't part of New Testament theology, if I said, oh man, you have to journal. Man, I love to go to conferences. You don't go to conferences? Oh my words, prayer walks. Prayer walks have been such a saving grace for me. I take those things that are really good, but then I try to force them on you. I try to make them Jesus plus. That leads to nowhere good. How things from the New Testament, things from New Testament theology, all the one another's 360 some love one another, care for one another, encourage one another. Yeah, like that's like buy in for all of us. Worshiping God first and foremost. Yeah, that's clear. That's like a buy in for all of us. Living a life of love that's defined by love. Man, that is so clear. That is for all of us. And when we lose our way and it becomes about Jesus plus. Man, that burden can become so heavy. And that yoke can become so hard. 
want to give you another stat uh, from that Barner report. One that concerned me. I'm not really sure what to do with this. One in five Christian working moms, 22%. That's about one of every five, two out of every 10. Aren't attending church right now in person or online. It made me think, you know, are there, are there things that I'm doing? Are there things that I could be doing that are like making life about Jesus plus? Come on, you'll hear me speak again and again about, man, if you would give me three hours, if you'd give me three corporate hours a week, I want you to worship. I'd love for you to serve. I'd love for you to connect. That's how disciples are made. We see that in Jesus' life with his disciples and for the past 2,000 years. But could you just hear this for me? If you're leaning towards this stat, and, you know, all of a sudden, church is feeling like a burden. The yoke is just feeling hard and heavy. And you're serving out of guilt? Stop serving. If you're connecting, you're going to that small group or that Bible study or that Sunday school, and you're doing it just because you feel like you have to, you must, ought, or need to, and it's weighing you down? Just, just take a break. If you're only going to give me one hour a week, what I believe Scripture is so incredibly clear about is spending that time just corporately worshiping your heavenly Father. Are there some really good things, some rules that, man, they would be so great for so much of your life. But right now in this unique season, in this unique time, they're just feeling like a burden. All of a sudden, Jesus' yoke seems so hard to you. What can we do to just release one another from those things? To invite people back into a loving relationship of just worshiping and being with their heavenly Father. And it's Mother's Day. And maybe you didn't like, get that gift yet. One last stat, one last thing for you. If you're looking for the best gift for moms in this current phase of life, this is what moms want more than anything else. More quiet time to regain perspective. What a gift. Man, does that line up with the heart of our Heavenly Father? Maybe it's the gift that a mom in your life so desperately needs. That place and that time to just be quiet and regain perspective. I want to read some of the last words that Paul gives and in instruction this way. In verse 20, he, he starts to wrap this whole idea of getting back to Jesus only, to let the rules fall away, to let the cultural stuff fall away. And he says this, You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teaching about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help. They provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. A lot of our man-made rules aren't bad. But when we take them to Jesus plus and force them on other people, it becomes bad. Let me leave you with a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this, one of the marks of a certain type of bad man, so this is a negative, he's calling us out. One of the marks of a certain type of mad, bad man is that he cannot give up something himself without wanting everyone else to give it up. That is not the Christian way. An individual Christian may see fit to give up all sorts of things for special reasons. Give up marriage, give up meat, give up beer, give up the cinema. But the moment, but the moment he starts looking down his nose at other people who do use them, he has taken the wrong turn. He has fallen into Jesus plus. So would you take some time this week 
And just look at the rules that might be spoken or written or unwritten, unspoken, that are really like in your life. And they don't represent the heart of your heavenly Father. And they're not drawing you to Jesus. They're pushing you or others away from Jesus. And just before you just completely jump back to normal, would you slow down and ask God, is there something that you're calling me to get back to better? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you love us. And because of that, you, you've put guidelines, you've put rules into our life that we can fully embrace and live by. Even when we don't understand them, even when we might not completely agree with them, there are rules in place because you want what is best for us because you love us. But we also confess that, man, there are times that we have taken rules of our culture. Man, we've taken rules like, you know, from like the old covenant. And, and when we've just went like full on Pharisee. We've expanded those rules. We've tried to push our rules on other people. And we have way too often fallen into that trap of Jesus plus. And our burdens have grown heavy. And the yoke of Jesus at times has seemed way too hard. So Holy Spirit, just help us as we examine our lives this week. If there are some rules that don't represent the heart of our Heavenly Father, some rules that don't line up with New Testament theology, may we be willing to reevaluate our lives and find that freedom in you. Freedom because of who you are and all that you have done, nothing that we could ever do. Finding freedom in Jesus. Accepting that invitation into a life in its fullest to come to a better understanding of what it means when Jesus says that his burden, his light, and his yoke is easy. May we live a life like that that draws other people to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
So earlier this week, I was in the Atlanta area, and I was looking for a place to eat. And I, I happened to stop at this one place, and I thought, hey, I'll check this out. And I walk in, and it was very clear that I am not the type of person who is usually in this restaurant. They are, they, apparently, they, they have one of these places where it's, it's local people. They know everyone who is in there. And I'm standing there in the lobby and I get a couple looks and no one's coming over. I don't know if I'm supposed to sit down. I don't know if I'm supposed to go to the counter. I, I, I have no idea what's happening. I, it got awkward enough that I just turned around and left. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Uh, it's too awkward for me. Have you ever been to some place new and it just felt really awkward and you didn't know what to do? Well, for a lot of people, church can be like that, especially if they've never been to church or they've, it's been a long time. It's a bunch of new people. There's a bunch of things that they don't know. Well, in order to help us with that, we're going to do Open House Sunday next Sunday. Now, what, what is that? What is that and what does it look like? Okay. Open House Sunday is basically, have you been to an open house like on a college campus or something where basically they run their normal they run their normal things, but they do extra stuff in order to help people connect. How do we, how do, we do this? What does a class look like? All those type of things. So what we're going to do next Sunday is we're going to run our normal services, but we're going to take extra time to explain every single thing we do. Why do we do announcements? What is a sermon and how long do I have to sit here for it? All those type of things, things that we take for granted those of us who attend on a regular basis. But to somebody new, it's awkward and they're not sure what's going to happen. So what we're going to do next week is we're going to try and correct a lot of those things. And so we're going to have a fun time explaining every single thing we do and making an extra effort to welcome guests. But now each one of you has a part in this too. There's a couple things that we want everyone to do. First off, invite somebody to come. It's a perfect Sunday to come. It's a great Sunday for someone who's never been to church before. It's a great Sunday for that person you've been getting to know but haven't quite invited yet. So invite somebody out next week. The second thing I want you to do is be aware that we'll have guests here next week. And go out of your way, say hi to somebody who's around you, who's near, near you that you're not familiar with. Uh, we're going to do name tag Sunday along with that to make it easier for everybody. So everyone should have a name tag on. Introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. Maybe they've been coming for a few weeks and you just don't know. Take an effort to get to know somebody new next week. So that's your goal. Think of somebody you can invite next week and then look around next week for somebody you don't know and introduce yourself and get to know them. So that's, that's the goal for next week, Open House Sunday. This will be the first one we're trying for this. Uh, so we, we hope everyone will participate, and then you can give us feedback on things we can do better next time. All right. Uh, mothers, if you have not had a chance to pick up your sticky bun over in the cafe, get that. It's for women over 18 years of old age. Go make sure you get a sticky bun. If you haven't had a chance to fill out your connection card, go ahead and take a moment to do that and place it in the black box on your way out. Until then, we'll see you next week. Have a great week.